Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Good afternoon. I'm Carol Pan from the library. Welcome to our second annual Birds of Prey program with Tom McCarty. Before we get started, I know you don't really want to listen to me, but I want to say a little bit about why we host this program. This is an outgrowth of our wildly popular Falcon Cam atop this very library. Donors and friends of the Cam make this program possible today, so thank you. Um, could we have a show of hands of Falcon Cam viewers or addicts? Yeah, a few of us. Um, I just want to shout out to a few people in the room that are not all here that I've had the honor of working with on the Falcon Cam for five years. Um, my esteemed colleagues in library systems and uh, Richard Knapworth, who's not here, but he's from facilities and campus planning. And so when you walk by and see that big metal arm hanging off the building, he he pledged this program, but he also designed that arm, which is particularly impressive because it withstands very foul weather and winds. Um, and also, it's it doesn't fall down, which is also good. Um, so the thing that it does, though, is that it looks at the birds from a vantage point um, that most boxes don't have. Most boxes have a camera inside the box, and so we get to see the birds as they go out on the parapet and start to learn to fly, which is also gives biologists and other wildlife people a chance to see a bit more than just what happens inside the nest box. So it's, in short, genius. Um, and then also our friends from Fish and Wildlife, which I don't think are here, but they also make this possible. So I do think that a lot of us are here because the camera has succeeded in bonding and lifting the spirits of many of the UMass community and beyond. Um, but since our mission is actually learning and scholarship, I wanted to share a few things that have happened um, due to the CAM, something that I don't know a lot about, which is the carnid fly. Uh, we were able to produce footage and new information about this pest of birds of prey. Um, but probably my favorite is the production of a, an award-winning essay by PhD uh, candidate <coughs> student, Kevin Yeo, well, see, I got it wrong, I knew it, um, who examined the relationship between the scholar life the people producing scholarship, earning scholarship, running and maintaining the facilities and grounds, and the falcon life, the falcon family that lives atop the largest publicly funded library in New England, and they really have a fine taste in lodging. It seems that nesting atop the Dubois Tower is exceedingly safe and also tasty because they have a lot to eat. The design of the campus around scholar life has um, relationally created enormous room for healthy falcon life. Um, just last night, I met a professor from HCC, and he said that he had sent um, a recent HCC grad here. She was anxious coming to the campus, and he sent her a link to the falcon cam, and her response was, wow, I love them. This is so amazing. I'm not going to be able to stop watching. You don't even understand how happy this email made me. I think some of us might know that feeling, and I am glad to report she's living in McNamara and doing very well. Um, okay, without further ado, Tom McCarty, uh, retired Fish and Wildlife Game Warden, licensed wildlife rehabilitator and educator, currently runs the Massachusetts Birds of Prey Rehab Facility in Conway, Massachusetts. We have a UMass connection to Tom and the Rehab Center. In August, an avid Falcon Camp viewer contacted the library about an injured red-tailed hawk that she saw on campus. Tom retrieved the hawk, its wing was badly broken, and took it to Mass Birds of Prey, and then released back into the wild. So that was wonderful. Um, at Birds of Prey, uh, Tom cares for injured birds and operates a successful captive breeding program. The facility houses raptors such as peregrine falcons, red-tailed hawks, kestrels, screech owls, great horn owls, all eagles, and a 32-year-old golden eagle that Tom had for more than 20 years. When birds arrive at the rehab center, they're evaluated, treated, and those that can be nursed back to health are returned to the wild. Birds that are not able to recover from the injuries sufficiently um, then become goodwill ambassadors, such as those you will be introduced to today. Tom's groundbreaking work with bald eagles has resulted in captive bred eagles reproducing in the wild and captive bred chicks being adopted into wild nests. Much of Tom's time is spent visiting schools and offering people the chance to experience these birds of prey firsthand. He travels throughout New England and New York giving lectures and showcasing selections of his birds, which you are about to experience. Thank you. Well, it's nice to be 
be here, uh, I'll have to admit I got lost. Every time I come on campus, I get lost. It's like a maze of roads and different things. And a couple of students stopped me and said, you can't be here with a truck. This is, this is a pedestrian walkway. But here I am. Um, I've worked in wildlife all my life. Uh, since I was a young guy, my, my focus was wildlife. That's all I wanted to do. When I went into the service, and four years in the service, when I got all, I applied for a job at the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And back then, it was, uh, the jobs were pretty readily, readily available because the environment was kind of like, who cares? But today, the environmental jobs are really up there. But anyway, I, I got this job and got promoted to conservation officer. Today, they call them environmental police. And I retired in 2001. 38 years enforcing the laws in the Commonwealth of Mass uh, in Fish and Wildlife. So I've been doing it all my life, and today I'm still doing it. A lot of people say to me, what a great hobby. What a great hobby. Ask my wife what kind of hobby it is. <laughs> um, so it, it's something I, I cherish. I, I do quite a bit of it. Uh, always rescuing birds. This year, quite a few birds uh, were brought in uh, for a lot of different injuries. You know, we're talking about the Falcon cam and all this other stuff. Boy, I'll tell you, I still use a pen and pencil. I, can't, I, I just can't get into all this electronic stuff. People call me and will say, uh, we'd like to get a hold of you. Uh, we'll send you an email. I don't have email. But I will fax you. Well, I don't have a fax. Well, you want Facebook? No. Do you have a website? No. Well, how are we going to get a hold of you? My God, what's going on? I said, pick up a phone, get a pen and pencil, and we'll talk. So I'm still kind of in dark ages. Uh, you know, we're all doing this today. I always say, you boys and girls, or ladies and gentlemen, they're going to have the biggest thumbs in the world in about 20 years. You know, like baseball bats. But we're talking about the cam uh, on the uh, Falcon nest, uh, different things like that. A lot of biologists are starting to realize that a lot of the electronic things we're using today are going to have an effect on wildlife in 20 or 30 years. Just like back in the 50s when we were spraying toxic, toxic DDT on planet Earth, everybody but Rachel Carson said it was the greatest thing in the world. It's going to get rid of the insects, include, uh, increase crop production, and what did it do? It just about annihilated a lot of different types of wildlife. So the funny about the cell phone towers, wind farms, solar panels, not causing problems with wildlife. So in 20 or 30 years, it might be something that have to have to change. But you know, when I talk about uh, birds of prey, I'm really speaking about all types of wildlife. And the person asked me, if you had to say which animals represented the conservation movement the best, I would say the African elephant, the African elephant. This piece of ivory that's really worth nothing right now is worth its weight in gold. The African elephant is in serious trouble because of this piece of ivory. And most biologists agree that if we do not stop the illegal trafficking in ivory, the last wild African elephant will be gone within 10 years. And uh, because a lot of the countries where the African elephant exists are real poor countries, the ivory is, is very, very valuable. Not only ivory, whales too. Even, even the whale, some countries still hunt on the whale. It's a sperm whale uh, too. So when I speak about wild, birds of prey, I'm really talking about all types of wildlife because they all have the same problem. People. Here in Massachusetts, we have over 50 different species of wildlife that are on the state and danger of threatened this right now. I put a few things together just to show you. All illegal loggerhead turtle. This is the leather from a, a loggerhead turtle destined to be a pair of shoes or something. Illegal. This little display I put together, kind of interesting. Rhinoceros horn, right here. Bottle of pills. Tiger bone, right here. A bottle of pills. The foot, 
taken as a trophy of the largest eagle in the world, the hockey eagle. Tiger Bomb made it into a, a POTUS. In this blue can, it says Russian sturgeon. It's not. It's American paddlefish. The Russian sturgeon has been depleted. So they use the American paddlefish, they strip of its eggs, recan it as Russian caviar, they ship it back to us Americans, and we pay $500 an ounce for American paddlefish. And right here is a bracelet, a tusk, a tooth from a pygmy crocodile, and over here, a comb in a water bottle of soap. That's from the Hawksbill turtle. So these are all different things that are done to wildlife today. And one last thing. We'll look at some birds. Oh, I love this book. It's a great book. It's a children's book, but it says she's wearing a dead bird on her head. <laughs> you know, I look at the fashions of the people today in school. When I went to school, I had to wear a shirt and tie. In her day, Mrs. Hemming or Mrs. Hall, in the 1890s, the fashion of the day, women wore <coughs> feather hats like this. And the feather hat was very popular. These two women in Boston, Mrs. Hemingway and Mrs. Hall, were outraged. How dare we slaughter all these beautiful birds just so someone could flatten them on the top of their head. They went to see the governor. Didn't get any help. They went to Washington. Didn't get any help. The reason being, in 1890, a woman had no voting rights, so no politician would help her. Well, these two women were very persistent. They got together and they formed the Massachusetts Audubon Society. And these two women were responsible for getting a law passed in 1903, and that law is still in effect today. And it states, you cannot possess the feathers of protected birds unless you have a special federal license or you are a full-blooded Native American. And Native Americans, because of their heritage and their culture, they are entitled to keep eagle feathers. Two fans made with two pounds of bald eagle tail feathers. Okay. Drive along the highways. You'll see the red tail hawk sitting in the trees along the road. They've learned over the years of revolution, very easy to catch a prey. Sit there long enough, a rat or a mouse or a squirrel, they try to get it across that pavement. Easy to catch, and unfortunately, many of the birds get hit by automobiles. And at night, the same thing happens uh, with owls. So a lot of different problems that I've encountered today. And this is pretty interesting right here. That's a feather from a red-tailed hawk. A gentleman called me a few years back and said, I've got a hawk in my backyard. It doesn't look too good. When I got there to rescue the bird, that's what its feathers looked like. Couldn't figure it out. Dr. Schmidt in South Deerfield, veterinary clinic, a great guy, helps me an awful lot. He looked the bird over and he thought, maybe it's parasites, nothing on the bird. Finally, after several birds came in in this condition, finally figured it out. The landfill. We dump our garbage in the landfill. The bulldozer pushes the garbage over, covers it with earth, fills up methane gas under the soil. They get rid of the methane gas, they put the pipes in the ground. They don't want it to go into the atmosphere, so let's ignite it. So every once in a while, the ignite it goes off, shoots a flame up. The hawks come in, land on a pipe, watching for mice. Rats, perfect spot, a landfill, and the flame goes up, here's the result. So the landfills now are putting different uh, apertures on the pipes to stop the uh, destruction of birds like that. Okay. Peregrine fell. What a bird. I've worked with hundreds of them over the years, but you know it's always nice. See a beautiful peregrine falcon. But I'm going to show you a peregrine falcon. It's still beautiful. Here's what happens in the environment. I'll show you some technical bird. Figure hit 
by a plane. But one wing. One wing it was hit by a type of cop. And luckily the people in the plane were not injured. When I received the call, I went down the rescue the bird. If this was a red tail or a more common species, we would probably euthanize the bird. But being a peregrine falcon, we decided let's try to save this bird's life. And we did. But the vet had to take the wing completely off. Now when you see a peregrine fly, I mean it's just an incredible, incredible bird. Incredibly fast. They have built for speed. And they're bird hunters. They catch mostly birds. And when you look at a peregrine falcon, you'll notice that black line under the eye. Most birds of prey that are fast, the falcons, the cheetah in Africa and some of the other predators have that black line. Even Tom Brady puts a black line <laughs> under his eye. But the peregrine was endangered back in the 50s because of pesticide contamination. And it really started to come back right now. And I mentioned before, or maybe I didn't, loss of habitat is one of the biggest problems facing wildlife. The loss of habitat with the peregrine, rock climbers, bungee jumpers, hand gliders, all using the less nesting areas, the ledges that this bird likes. So what did the bird do? He went to the boy's library and nested on top. Because he should be over Mount Tom, or Mount Sugarloaf, or Rattlesnake Gutter. That's the natural uh, habitat for the peregrine falcon. Now you might notice, when you look at this bird, he's just holding up into the adult plumage. He was brown when he was rescued. And he's got that beautiful blue plumage coming in right now. I'm going to walk around, and I hope you don't poop on the floor. <laughs> Look at the size of his feet. Incredible. It's up there. You notice the tail. The tail he is uh, molting out. He's got his new tail feathers coming in. Let me share a couple of other threads I brought with me. 
uh, this next bird endangered here in Massachusetts. Wrong box. <laughs> Sound. You're picking up sound. 
The owl has soft feathers for silent flight. Because he's not only listening, he's watching and listening. So a soft flight, a soft feather can fly flight. Now if you look at this bird, the tufts of feathers on the top of his head, they call it ear tufts. But they're basically there for concealment, for camouflage. Picture this bird sitting on a, on a stump, or sitting in, a, in the forest. That tuft of feathers will give this bird the look of maybe a broken branch, something like that. Eastern screech off. Watch his head. His eyes are fixed in the socket. They can't move. So if I move my hand, <laughs> <laughs> his head will stay perfectly still. In order to see in any direction, of course, he has to move his head. And you'll see that in a minute with the larger owl that I brought in today. So it's called Eastern screech owl. Something 
flip it around. Go you know, move that flip it around over his shoulder. Now watch, he's going to, uh, if I put him against my chest, his natural, natural reaction is going to be to flex him so far. I put his head up straight up in the air. And if you walk by, you probably still think it's an old broken branch. It's called the Great Horn Owl. Largest, most common owl uh, here in New England. You'll notice uh, the owl's feet, they're feathered all around to the tips of the toes. And one last thing about owls, are all birds of prey. They regurgitate a pellet. And most people call them owl pellet. They're actually a pellet of every raptor. Cats do it, foxes, seagulls, crows and all birds of prey. And that pellet is very important to the health of the bird. If I took this great home now, and I fed it a steady diet of chicken meat, or hamburger, or, or stew meat, he wouldn't survive very long. He'd get sick pretty quickly. And the reason is the pellet. When that pellet is ready to regurgitate, the feathers, the fur, and the bones of the animal ate the night before, it takes all the impurities out of its system. When it opens his mouth, and coughs up that pellet, it feels like it's just a big ball of grease. So that color is very important. <laughs> so that's a great one out. Largest wing on out. Oh, so close. <laughs> <laughs>